Hi, my name is Rob Beshin. Over the next few minutes, I would like to go over two major parts of my whistleblower complaints. First, I will explain the mechanics and mathematics of how leveraged and inverse exchange traded products operate. Second, I will discuss the extreme use of reverse splits. Before we start, let's try and define fraud. The FBI definition. The term securities fraud covers a wide range of illegal activities, all of which involve the deception of investors or the manipulation of financial markets. The Department of Justice says this in regard to the statute of fraud. The law does not define fraud. It needs no definition. It is as old as falsehood and as versatile as human ingenuity. The Fourth Circuit also noted that fraud is a broad term, which includes false representations, dishonesty, and deceit. I've constructed a narrative or game to demonstrate the basic yet counterintuitive mathematics of the fraud. For this exercise, I encourage you to put yourself in the mindset of someone trying to defraud others. In my view, it's easier to spot fraud if you think like a thief. In this narrative, there are three participants, two players and the house. The players win based on opposite outcomes of the flip of a coin. Both players will start with $1,000 and the house will collect the losses and pay out the winnings. The house's balance will only increase if there is a net loss by both players. For each coin toss or round, if heads player one will get a 50% increase and player two loses 50%. Likewise, if tails, player two will get a 50% increase while player one loses 50%. Upon first observation, one might think this is a binary outcome with an equal probability of profit and loss, just as a coin flip is binary. One winner and one loser. Let's play 10 rounds and see just how wrong that assumption is. As you can see from this table, the house took 60% of the pot without ever taking financial risk, investing any of their own funds, or adding economic value. Player one won 60% of the time and still lost 29%, and player two suffered a devastating loss. This is exactly the way leverage and inverse ETNs and their pairs work. They are mathematically, and I repeat, mathematically guaranteed to go down 100% of the time. And the more time that goes by, the more dramatic the decline. These products were designed and constructed this way on purpose to enrich the issuers, the distributors, the brokers, and advisors that peddle this shit. Fact can non verba. Facts don't lie. Math, past performance, and future predictions are all immovable. The fraud cannot go on forever. And due to the size of this market, when it blows up, and it will, there will be knock-on effects. Many may be systemic. My SEC filing outlined these possibilities, and this was before DGAS blew up in 2020. Disclosures from issuers or forcing clients to sign documents stating they understand the risks buried in a 200 plus page prospectus does not provide the issuers cover for fraud. The SEC and other regulators have a duty to protect investors, sometimes even to protect investors from themselves. These products should have never been approved for distribution, and it's time to get them off the market. Let's pull up some ETN pair charts and see if my game analysis plays out in real life. Most of the ETNs I listed in my initial whistleblower complaints and all ETNs from Credit Suisse have now been delisted but not before many of the issuers made many tens of billions. Are they going to quietly escape into the night without criticism, keeping tens of billions of investors' money? That's up to you and me. The SEC has failed to reject leverage and inverse exchange-traded notes, and now the Bank of Montreal has taken Credit Suisse's place in issuing this shit. More to come on that later. The first four months of 2020, nearly every single leveraged ETN and leveraged ETF product pair was down and down big, some over 80% in a few months. Issuers made tens of billions as they marked to market to these products. As Rome was burning, Nero, or Credit Suisse, was cashing in. Do your own research. These are all provable facts, and all of which happened after my first two whistleblower complaints. Could regulators have stopped this prior to it happening? I think so. As hundreds of billions in leveraged ETPs crashed in early 2020, can we even begin to calculate the effects this had or forced liquidations this caused? 
Could these products have potentially collapsed the entire financial system? Given the size of the leveraged ETP market, once again, I think so. Could these products pose systemic risk? Are they being used as collateral for something we don't know about? What firms have outsized exposure to these products? If hundreds of billions of these products are and have been issued, someone must own them. Does anyone really know who or how much? This and more was given a specific detail to the SEC. The day of my call with the SEC in March 2020, many of these products were collapsing in dramatic fashion. Both leveraged ETN and ETFs, which I had predicted months before in my SEC filings, most issuers abandoned and any effort to keep these product pairs or orderly. Remember, these should have inverse performance intraday, meaning if one was down 10%, its inverse pair should be up 10%. This did not happen. Another failure. At the expense of purchasers and with measurable direct benefit to the issuers as they marked to market these products with huge multi-billion dollar daily gains. Is this fair or is this fraud? How do issuers hide the horrible performance of their ETNs and continue to issue more notes at a higher price, which most do on a consistent basis? Certainly few investors would purchase a security, which was priced at $20 18 months ago and now trades at under one. Through a trick called reverse splits, in the example of TVIX, over the course of seven years, 2012 to 2019, 25 million notes were converted to one. Let me repeat, 25 million to one, making the ETM price 25 million times larger than it should have been, or what it would have been without this deceptive practice. UGAS price was 12,500 times more, and GASO was 255,000 times more. These were all part of my original complaint, and since have been delisted, but no fines to the issuers. Coincidence? Probably. Charts don't lie, and we can look at the split-adjusted prices via long-term charts. TVIX split adjusted would have been over $2 billion per note in 2010. UGAS would have been over 400,000 per note and GASL over 20 million. Or if we back out the splits and we take the current price and divide it by 25 million for TVIX, we get 0 0.00000025 or under one ten thousandth of a penny. The same goes for many other products. Remember the issuing financial institutions are constantly creating more notes and selling them to market. Reverse splits allow them to issue notes at a higher price. Could you imagine an issuer calling up their distributors or sales channels and saying, I need to place two trillion notes at a value of 1 16th of a penny, find me buyers. Are you beginning to see the need for deception in this industry? Without deception, this scheme would fall apart. One rule the SEC could make would collapse this fraudulent segment of the financial system. What would that rule be? No reverse splits for any reason. Financial institutions would not be able to issue these ETNs or ETFs at fractions of a dollar or penny. If you believe that statement, as I do, we have just proved securities fraud according to the FBI definition. Let's not forget issuing additional notes puts downward pressure on the price of the ETNs, creating a virtuous cycle for the institutions that profit on the decline in the price of the ETNs they issue. It's important to remember ETNs are considered debt on the issuer's balance sheet. As the price of the ETNs decrease, their profit from issuing the security increases. Questions, why are these reverse splits allowed? What regulators approve these splits? Did these concerns not come up on anyone's radar? Really? At a minimum, the issuers themselves knew what they were doing and why they were doing it. Are they going to claim it was an accident? That they weren't knowingly manipulating the ETN price in order to ensure a market of buyers for additional sales? Remember, we already established it's pretty hard to convince investors to purchase ETNs valued at fractions of a penny. If they were ignorant, then I contest they shouldn't be trusted with anyone's money or with being in business. Don't you agree? Let's compare ETN reverse splits with corporate stocks. What is the most number of reverse splits a corporate stock has ever gone through before being delisted and forced to do so? Does anyone want to compare this number to the 25 million to one that TVIX did in seven years? Is this fair or is this fraud? Let's put this into context. 
Under this logic, if Enron had just done large enough reverse splits and issued more stock at a higher manipulated price, it would still be a $60 security and in great financial health. Let's remember all leveraged and inverse ETPs, both ETNs and ETFs were approved by the SEC after much scrutiny and criticism. Is the SEC going to be in a hurry to admit a mistake? Are there or were there any of the employees at the SEC or CFTC that were responsible for the approval of these products that were later employed or contracted by any of the issuers? If so, what positions? What pay did they receive? Did they benefit financially from their previous approval? This would be a very obvious conflict of interest. Is it likely that any regulators are going to admit dropping the ball and not adequately protecting investors? It's important we ask these and more tough questions and bring this to broader attention. The squeaky wheel gets the grease and it's time to get loud. It's my belief that financial institutions have a fiduciary responsibility to act in the best interest of those they serve and the public, even if they can legally skirt this responsibility. This is the tip of the iceberg, and I look forward to sharing more. A lot of bad actors are making billions, not millions, off of these products. And it's not just the issuing financial institutions. It's also any third party in the distribution and marketing channels, and financial advisors, and the brokerages they work for. The SEC recently fined some of these parties for these products, which was part of my initial complaint, as well as a large point of my discussion with the SEC on the phone in March of 2020. By mimicking what the issuers do legally, it's possible to generate returns well in excess of 40% a year, every year. This, in my opinion, is the nail in the coffin of any defense of these products by regulators or by the issuers. This alone will eliminate the issuance of these products with, with or without SEC involvement. When the world learns of the fraud and can follow along in real time, the opportunity to exploit the public, which this fraud does, goes away. I can guarantee I'm not the only one that knows how these products operate. They were designed this way on purpose and I'm willing to bet there are powerful hedge funds shorting the shit out of these products and making billions. Regulators can find out. They have that power. Let's get loud and make them look. Just like in the game I presented earlier, all frauds must have a patsy. These products, in one way or another, must make their way into the hands of the unknowing or the ignorant. To the ignorant, by marketing and promotion, and to the unknowing, likely through advisors, or being held on behalf of clients in advisory accounts, or as part of a basket of products like other ETFs, funds, and the like. As the layers of this onion are uncovered, it will start to smell more and more like purposeful, deliberate, well thought out fraud. I have or will shortly provide or have provided the SEC, Warren Buffett, Jeffrey Gundelock, Michael Burry, Michael Lewis, Peter Elkind, and John Carreyou, and every other investigative journalist I can find, my full research, and as much of my time as they wish to take to discuss. I am asking them and others to review and opine or give their opinion. If I'm wrong, they should let me know how. If I'm right or any part of my analysis correct, they should speak up. Many look up to them. Let's get loud and just ask the right questions. And I owe you. Tell me, how many of the Fortune 500 companies fail to generate $5 billion in profit each year and actually add economic value? Please follow me on the following channels and let's get loud and continue the discussion. After all, this is the reason behind the SEC whistleblower program. So that people like me and like you can expose can expose fraud and make a difference and help make the financial system better in the process. Join me. I want to make one more comment that's strictly my opinion. If you believe this to be fraud and you're currently a client of any of the issuers of these products, fire them. Likewise, if you believe this isn't fraud and you're a client of any of the issuers of these products and they didn't alert you to the amazing limited risk of shorting these snake oil products for an extreme profit, fire them 
for keeping it to themselves. Either way, they didn't put you, the client, first.